This is Tessa Keo, and for the next five weeks, our Tuesday's tips here in the Legacy Virtual Users Group community are going to cover various aspects of e-learning. Since everyone should be back in school, it being the last day of September, I thought I would provide an overview of what we'll cover and then get to it. And because it's Family History Month starting tomorrow, the entire month of October devoted to family history, our favorite subject. Please look for additional tips on using both well-known and little-known legacy features. Some of you use legacy version 7.5, while many of you use version 8.0, so we'll be sure to include something for everyone. And if you have tips to share or favorite legacy features that you don't think are sufficiently well-known, please share them right here in the Legacy Virtual Users Group community in the Tips and Tricks section. So today, let's focus on e-learning, the first of our five-part video series. As many of you have probably noticed, the opportunities to continue our education have exploded in the past seven years, and that's when I started doing genealogy. Between monthly meetings, seminars, and conferences, our opportunity to attend in-person classes has grown. However, there are often significant costs associated with in-person learning, whether that's travel time and expenses or attendance fees, just to name a few examples. The truly amazing thing is that with access to an MP3 player, a smartphone, a DVD player, or a computer, many of those same classes are available to us, all from the comfort of our own homes, offices, or libraries, and oftentimes on our own schedules and for little or no cost. This month we're going to talk about a variety of educational opportunities available through e-learning. Tomorrow I'll post a seven-page handout that provides an overview of the topics and a number of links to various types of e-learning opportunities. Those links will be useful to you when you're making decisions on what type of e-learning you want to check out. Hopefully, some of the 66 links will be new to you. So today, let's take a step back from the actual e-learning opportunities and talk about the basics. Before you invest your time and effort in watching a webinar, attending a hangout, choosing an online course, or joining a peer study group, you want to take stock and make some conscious decisions about how and why you engage in e-learning. So let's get started. In the broadest sense, e-learning is simply the use of electronic technology in whole or in part in the process of education. E-learning can be reading something online, perhaps Wikipedia, using either a CD or DVD to watch a tutorial on a particular topic, or attending university online to gain your undergraduate or graduate degree. If you think about it, e-learning is simply the next iteration of distance learning. As early as 1840, correspondence courses were first introduced. This method of correspondence courses was enhanced first with radio and then recordings, and over time it has been especially helpful to returning students, working students, and students located in rural areas. In the late 1960s, the first open universities were introduced using the newest technologies available to increase access to education all over the world. And as technology continues to evolve, and with the introduction of the Internet, distance learning has become electronic learning. Most of us use electronic technologies for many things, at work, for banking, shopping, and keeping in touch with family and friends. Technology continues to give us more choices, greater opportunities, and allows us to save, and sometimes waste, time. So it's really no surprise that education has been transformed by the use of electronic technology as well. These electronic technologies for education are used for learning and training. We tend to think of learning as concept-based education, math or science, often those subjects we learned in school. We tend to think of training as skill-based education, artisan and technical trades, or computer technology. Most e-learning opportunities are provided by one of two delivery methods. In the first type, all the participants are present at the same time, 
This type of e-learning resembles the traditional classroom. We may all register for a webinar and attend live, although we're located in different places. This type of e-learning requires that we figure out time zones and work with online meeting software and that we all receive the information at the same time. In the second type, participants can access course materials on their own schedules. Students are not in the same place at the same time learning together. Think of this as message board forums, email, videos, audio recordings, and PDF materials. Some of the best e-learning uses a combination of both methods. Hangouts on Air at Google Plus are live and recorded for later viewing. Most communities that use Hangouts on Air have a dedicated event so that comments can be made before, during, and after the broadcast. And moderators answer questions and address comments after the fact. Online courses often include lectures, assignments, student discussions, group projects, as well as individual quizzes. Whether it's learning or training, whether it's a traditional online classroom or a self-paced flexible classroom, whether it's a 10-minute video or a six-week course, we have the opportunity to gain knowledge by different methods. With the current state of our technology, the possibilities are limitless and will only continue to evolve. And that's both the good news and the bad news. There is lots out there online. In fact, a quick Google search for online courses brings back 117 million results. As with so many results, it's difficult to judge the relevance or quality, and we can easily be overwhelmed. If we filter our search with the terms genealogy or family history, our revised Google search brings back almost 35 million hits. Even with another filter for our search to include the term free, our revised Google search brings back almost 18 million results. That is still far too many results. How much time do you have to check them out and what other terms might you use if you were starting this exploration on your own? Lucky for us genealogists and family historians, we have a friend in Cindy's list. For over 18 years, Cindy has been our reference librarian, making sure that we have the links categorized by subject, location, or time period, so we can focus on using those genealogical resources. Think of Cindy as organizing the classrooms in the genealogy schoolhouse so we're able to pick and choose the subjects, classes, and teachers we want. By searching for education and genealogy, the category index Clearly, there's something for everyone, and the choices serve as a reminder that e-learning is not just one type of learning. The related categories are quite helpful. Cindy provides links for how-tos, skill levels, and formats for learning. Cindy's list is a great start as you navigate your e-learning opportunities in genealogy. However, I think that sometimes genealogists and family historians unnecessarily limit themselves. And that's understandable with all those Google results we saw in our first pass for online courses. Rather than focus solely on genealogy education, what subjects and skills do genealogists and family historians need to learn and use? My vote for subjects includes history, geography, both physical and cultural geography, religion, math, it's helpful to be able to do simple calculations and not rely on our genealogy database programs. Statistics, because it's important to understand how statistics are arrived at, if they accurately reflect what we intend them to, and how to use them. Economics, writing and grammar, and biology. At the point where we introduce genetics and DNA tests into our family research, we want to make sure we understand it. My vote for skills includes data entry, writing, editing, and publishing our work, productivity tools such as spreadsheets and relational databases, basic and intermediate computer skills, the ability to use the internet and an email program, and the ability to use technology tools such as a camera, scanner, smartphone, tablet, and e-reader. Many of these subjects and skills are general knowledge areas, so we need to take a look at all types and resources for e-learning. Now it's time to answer an important question. What type of learner are you? 
If you think back to your favorite subjects or favorite instructors, you will probably find that your learning style meshed with their teaching style. For many of us, if we had trouble with a subject, it was probably because the instructor did not teach that subject in a variety of ways that could engage the different learning styles. There are three main learning styles, auditory, tactile, and visual. Let's take a quick look at each. Do you like to listen to podcasts? Are you able to work through a problem after someone has described it to you? Do you like to listen to stories? Do you have good recall of what was said at a lecture or meeting? Do you learn best by repeating the information, either aloud or to yourself? If you do take notes during a lecture, do you find that they're of little use in recalling the lecture? Then you're an auditory learner, together with about 30% of the population. These are the students who enjoy listening and learn best from oral presentations, have excellent recall, and are good storytellers themselves, because they're all ears. Do you want the lecture to just get on with it? Would you prefer to do the task with just the main points for instruction? Do you like to take things apart, see how they work, and put them together again? Do you prefer to listen or watch and do the activity at the same time? Then you're a tactile learner, together with approximately 30% of the population. This percentage has increased significantly over the past 15 years as we use more technology and collaborative learning and working. These are the students who enjoy doing an activity, working out process problems, and working with technology and accomplishing tasks. Because for tactile learners, actions speak louder than words. When you want to learn something, do you go to the library or bookstore and get the book on the subject? Do you enjoy making or reviewing graphics or charts to explain concepts or information? Do you read the slides in a PowerPoint presentation? Are you drawn to images in a visual presentation as well as the fonts and colors? Do you enjoy reading the information or watching a demonstration before attempting to incorporate the lesson? Then you're a visual learner, together with about 40% of the population. These are the students who take very complete notes during the lecture, usually annotate their written materials, and draw pictures, graphs, or use images to recall concepts. Oftentimes, they can remember where information is located on a page, because if you show a visual learner something, she will understand. Now, you probably recognized yourself in one or more of those learning styles. So, why is it important to know what your preferred learning style is? Because how you learn affects whether you learn. As a student, you'll want to match your learning style, to the extent you can, to the educational opportunities you're interested in, because then you'll get the most out of them. If you learn best by listening, you'll be drawn to podcasts and lectures. If you learn best by watching and doing, you'll be drawn to videos and workshop-type courses. If you learn best by reading and viewing, you'll be drawn to multimedia presentations or the reading materials that accompany a lecture. Now that you know your learning style and know what e-learning is, are you ready to go back to school?